Lord in heaven, hallowed be their name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, here, as it is in heaven. So there's, a, there's a culture of the, the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of Jesus, that we don't just look forward to, but we pray for and look to implement even now. And so we did a timeline a couple of weeks ago where we talked about where we're at in the story of Scripture, we talked about creation, the fall, redemption, the work of Jesus Christ, uh, laying his life down, rising from the dead, and the future promise of the restoration of all things, the new heavens and the new earth. And we talked about that this is our hope. We talked about how in Scripture you'll, you'll hear salvation mentioned both as this moment, what Jesus did here, and salvation mentioned as the coming salvation, the new heavens and the new earth. And we located the fact that we live in this space here. This is where we're at in the timeline, where we're aware that not all is as it should be. You and I both know that. We've experienced that this morning, this past week, a deep sense of this isn't how it's meant to be. And so that's the, the, the role of this series is to say, how do we live faithfully as the people of God in that time, in this time where we're at? And this morning, the, the topic of what we're going to be talking about is injustice. How do we live in this time where injustice often seems to reign, to be the most powerful force around us? We're very aware of injustice around us. And I've titled this morning's message as Citizens of Justice in a City of Injustice. Citizens of justice in a city of injustice. I love cities. Cities are incredible. And they serve as sort of like a, a macrocosm, a, a large-scale representation of humanity, of the fact that within each of us there, there's sort of uh, some good things that we're proud of, and there's some parts to us, some evil, that's like, oh, I'm, not, I'm not proud of that. And cities just highlight that on a much larger scale. And if you ask people, you know, what do you, what's one of your favorite things about Chicago? Oftentimes you'll hear people say, the culture. I love the fact that depending on where you go in the city, you can feel like you're in an entirely different place. And, and I love that too. This, this richness in neighborhoods and blocks that, that reminds you of where those people have come from. Where, where the heritage that, that is represented in the city is from. So, for instance, here in Humboldt Park, you've got the Puerto Rican flags on Division Street, right? There you go. And you go down and you get some, uh, you get some hiburitos on Division Street, and you feel, I've never been to Puerto Rico, but I can imagine this is what it feels like. I remember walking uh, with a prayer walk on Good Friday, and David showed me a house. He said, this house is exactly how it is in Puerto Rico, where this person has, has made their home represent feel like where they've come from. You go down to Little Village, it, it feels like you're in Mexico. Again, I haven't been in Mexico, so I just go down to Little Village. It's way cheaper and way shorter. It feels like you're in a different country. Or you go to Chinatown, and it feels like, man, where am I? I can't read anything. What's going on? It feels like you're in a different place. Or my personal favorite, you go to Little Wisconsin. <laughs> we don't have a whole neighborhood yet. Give us time. You just step into a Culver's and you're like, I'm home. I'm home. Joel, we're so happy you're with us and you don't have to go to Wisconsin. We brought Wisconsin to you. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But these neighborhoods, these blocks, these homes, these restaurants that remind you of where you've come from. And the beauty, the heritage, the richness of that. But we're also well aware as a city that, you know, there's, there's not all beauty. You walk around and you see trash on the streets or boarded up businesses. You're like, okay, there's beauty and there's brokenness at a physical level. But we're also aware that there's beauty and there's brokenness at a, at a deeper moral level as well. Again, as a macrocosm of humanity, of who we are as people, you have amazing justice work being done in so many different ways and places. I think of Lawndale Christian Health Center. I think of New Life Centers. I think of Inner City Impact. I think of Church Down the Street, River City. There's so much amazing work that is being done that we praise God for. But then at the same time, we also know that 
there's injustice that is part of who we are as a city as well. We're a city built on Native American lands. We're a city with a history of redlining and other racist practices that you look around and you see the situation. How did we get here? It didn't just happen. The centuries and layers of injustice got us to this point. So you see it. You feel it. Forgive me for a moment. Every time I decide I'm going to use my laptop, problems happen. So hang with me for a moment. But you feel this, this injustice. And this is, where, this is where we lie, in the city of injustice. Hold on one sec. In our own Hubble Park community, where the poverty rate is 23% and the murder rate is seven times the national average. And we feel that, and for those in the room who hit, this hits your very family, this hits your day-to-day -day existence more than anyone else. This isn't just a topic in the news. This is part of our lived experience. Which begs the question, then, how do we live in a city of injustice? It's not unique to Chicago. I'm not another person just pointing at you. This is the, the plight of cities as macrocosms of humanity. How do we live as citizens of justice? Scripture talks about the fact that when we put our trust in Jesus Christ, our, our citizenship has changed. Your spiritual ID indicates that you're part of a new city. Paul writes about in Philippians, you're part of the, the, the new city that we're longing for. How do we live as citizens of justice in a city of injustice? And what I want to do this morning is I first want to define justice, and then I want to talk a little bit about that, and then I want to talk about two cities, justice, uh, the first city of injustice, and then the final city of, of justice, and then we're going to land for the longest portion in a city in between those. So, so first I just want to say, what, what is justice? And I'm not going to do justice to the topic this morning, all right? Pun intended. Like, it is way too broad. As I was looking into this the last two weeks, there were so many rabbit trails I went down. I was like, Lord, help me to stay focused. Help me to stay focused. But I want somebody to read the definition of justice that you have in front of you. Or on the screen. Justice restores peace. We're going to talk about peace later on briefly. Shalom, the sense of all is as it should be. Justice restores peace through two components there in particular. Fair responses to acts of evil. Let's, let's talk about that just for a moment. Acts of evil happen. Um, and let's think about, as an example, the war on drugs, right? A response to evil, a response to sin in the world, but a response that was not fair. Right? The, the judgments given by the justice system were not fair. Not fair in the sense of who got what sentences, people of color having astronomically larger sentences than those in the white community, and fair in saying, should anyone be given that large a sentence? Is this even the right response to that? So a, a response that would leave you going, that's not, that's not the answer. That's not a just response. And that's one example, right? There's so many others that we could look at. And then you have a healing response to the effects of evil. So then you say, okay, that, that situation has so many layers. Within families, if someone is, is on drugs, what are the effects that are taking place in that family? Now if the, the, the parent is incarcerated, now there are even more effects in the family. And now that you have generations of this, and the layers and the layers of this, and as a people of justice, we say, how can we bring uh, peace? How can we bring shalom? And there's all these layers of injustice and the effects of that. But those are the people that we're called to be. 
citizens of justice in a city of injustice. Oftentimes, in talking about responses to acts of evil, there's two, two sort of primary ways you see it in Scripture and talked about. Retributive, a punishment for a crime. You'll see this in Genesis 9 where the Lord says, if someone takes someone's life, I'm going to demand the life from that person. Now, I'm not advocating for the death penalty, uh, but I'm just saying that's, you'll see that in Scripture. Or you'll see many examples of a restorative justice, a response to evil that is also wanting to bring the individual back into community, saying the goal is peace and restoration, not just isolation forever, just get out of here forever. That's the overarching arc of scripture, as well as individual moments. You'll see some passages listed in your handout that you can look at later. Scripture, over and over again, especially in the Old Testament, will locate that the effects of evil don't affect everyone equally. That those who make the rules, that those who are in power, or those who have more resources, are not typically affected in the same way as those who don't have resources, or those who don't have power. And so the Lord makes really clear in the Old Testament, he wants his people to be noted as uniquely giving attention to what one theologian says, the quartet of the vulnerable. The quartet of the vulnerable. Somebody read out the quartet of the vulnerable in the Old Testament. Widow, poor, orphan, immigrant. Those who in their society wouldn't have a lot of resources, wouldn't have a lot of power, wouldn't have a lot of weight at City Hall. Those who could easily not just be overlooked, but be used to advantage those who are in power. And the Lord is saying, no, that's not how my community of people are going to operate. You're going to be noted by looking out for those individuals. And we know, thousands of years later, that that's still the case. And that is still our call as the people of God, to be very aware of and working towards justice for those whose voice aren't being heard, or those who don't have the resources to, to garner attention from other people. The quartet of the vulnerable. But this way of, of being in a city has been going on for almost forever. I want you to, to look up at the timeline. And right away, right after the fall in Genesis 3, in Genesis 4, you have the first city of injustice showing up. The first city of injustice. Cain murders his brother Abel. God says, you're going to be a wanderer. And he winds up building a city. A city that he names after his son, Enoch. And this city is the first city of injustice. It's also a city of culture. It's also a city where, where tremendous amount of culture is happening. Let me just read for us real quick. In Genesis 4, it says, Cain was intimate with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. Then Cain became the builder of a city, and he named this city Enoch after his son. Irad was born to Enoch. Irad fathered Mahujalah, da da da, some, some names that are really hard to say, fathered Lamech. Lamech took two wives for himself. One named Ada and the other named Zilla. Ada bore Jabel. He was the first of the nomadic herdsmen. So we've got some farming happening all of a sudden. His brother was named Jubal. He was the first of all who played the, the lyre and the flute. So now you have music happening. Zilla bore Tubal Cain, who made all kinds of bronze and iron tools. You have blacksmithing happening. Tubal Cain's sister was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, listen to this song. Listen to this poetry. Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, Lamech, pay attention to my words. For I killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain is to be avenged seven times over, then for Lamech it will be 77 times. So you have this character, Lamech, who is the most influential character in the city, who in this city of culture expanding, blacksmithing, music, farming. You also have corruption exploding. 
centered on this character, centered on his sexual desires and his power getting him what he wants. This is the first instance of polygamy in Scripture. Uh, Centered on his violence that he is glorifying to his wives. This sounds familiar to what we hear around us. It might sound familiar to what you yourself listen to, a glorification of violence, of sex, in a city of injustice. It's a city where parents probably told their kids, this is just the way it is, would sigh, no hope. But now I want us to jump ahead to the final city of justice up here that you can read about in Revelation 21 and 22, but I just want to read a brief excerpt in Revelation 22 in the first four verses where the writer says this. It says, The angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 croups, Twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. What beautiful imagery. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. A city bursting with life untainted, explosion of culture, a clean city, a city of life, a city, I have highlighted, of the Lamb. At the center of the city, not a character of violence, of sexual appetite, getting whatever he wants, a city of the Lamb. The the writer making sure that we haven't forgotten the person in the work of Jesus. Not glossing past what has happened to him. He who laid his life down in the most gruesome, shameful way. The city of the Lamb. The city of forgiveness. The city of the one who confronted evil, not just with more violence, but by taking violence in upon himself and reworking it to provide salvation for the people of the city. The city of the Lamb. A city where people tell one another not, this is just the way it is. But where this is the way it is, this is the way, it's too good to be true. No, this is the way it is of ever-growing exploration and delight and purpose. This city, that's where our citizenship lies. That's where our hope lies. That's where our future lies. We are citizens, as I'm calling it this morning, of the city of justice. But we live here. We live here. Not just Chicago, here as in the city of injustice that all of us find ourselves in, whether you're here in this place, you're watching online in a different location. How do we live as citizens of justice in a city of injustice? Now we're going to look at Jeremiah 29. So we bounced over a little bit. We're going to land in Jeremiah 29. We're going to be looking at four verses. You can turn with me. You can look in your handout. Jeremiah 29 has the people of God, the people of Israel. They have been exiled They have been kicked out of the land, out of their city of Jerusalem, and now they are in the city of Babylon. They are in the city of their enemies. They are the city of the, the ones who came, who captured them, who took them out of the city. They have left the city of promise, and now they're in the city of problems. They've left their city of destiny, and now they're in the city of despair. It tells us in verse 4, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. The Lord kicked them out of Jerusalem, has them in Babylon. And just prior to this, in in chapter 28, there was a false prophet who said, You're only going to be there like two years, and then the Lord's going to bring you back. Like, just hang tight, don't worry, he's going to get you out of that. And Jeremiah, via the Lord, is like, that's, that's not what I said. That's not what's going to happen. You're actually going to be there 70 years. And in fact, that false prophet, Hananiah, died. So you can't just make up what the Lord is saying. That's, that's serious business. And later on in Jeremiah 29 is where we get the, the famous verse, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, bless you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future You've probably heard that verse before. That is in this passage spoken to the people of God saying, after 70 years, I'm going to bring you back. 70 years is a long time. It's an amount of time that the adults in that place probably wouldn't see 
that future. It's a long time. It's a time where you could say, like, let's just hunker down and forget about, forget about us being the people of God and trying to serve him. Let's just survive. But the first thing that we notice of how we live as citizens of justice in a, in a city of injustice is this. To live with purpose and not passivity. If you paid attention two weeks ago, and remember, I used the same exact point. And you say, like, Pastor, that's just cheating. You can't regurgitate points multiple weeks in a row. Like, it's there, and I feel like it's a really important point, not just in this passage, but for us as people, to live with purpose and not passivity. Verses 5 and 6 say this. It says, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. At first glance, this just looks like the Babylonian American dream. Like, hey, just settle down, get married, have a couple kids, build a like, fence around your house, and just hang tight. Just settle down. And it's, it's, it's there. You know, there's, there's that component to it. But a far richer and more important component is that it is echoing the language from Genesis 1. The language of creation, the language of being made in the image of God and being given the purpose of God of you are called to flourish and to multiply and to rule and reign over the area that I give you, rule and reign over the earth. And the, the, the word of the Lord here is echoing that, saying you might be in a location you don't like, but your vocation hasn't changed. I don't mean vocation, like you're going and you're taking a break. I mean like the vocation, your purpose, your calling, the calling of God upon your life to implement the rule and reign of God in your life in all the different spheres where you're at. That hasn't changed. You might be in Babylon, but I still have a purpose for you. I still have a purpose. I don't want you to kick back for 70 years and to settle into pass passivity and even to say, well, you know what? I'm in the land of my enemy, so I don't want them to get blessed. My passivity is actually like what I should be doing. No, 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 no. You're the people of God. You had a purpose back then, and you still have a purpose even in that, that space. The city of injustice, your purpose remains. Live with purpose and not passivity. I don't know what location you are in. Maybe it's the job that you're in that you're like, this crushes my soul. I hate going to work on Monday morning. Can I encourage you that your location doesn't stop your vocation? Can I encourage you that in your job to live with purpose, God has you there for a reason? Because a person who's just living in passiv passivity, they're never going to notice the injustice of the workplace around them. Or if they do, they're just going to say, this is just the way it is. But when you're living with purpose, you will notice injustice. And you'll say, no, that's not what it looks like on earth as it is in heaven. And I've been called to do something about that. In your workplace, live with purpose and not passivity. In your marriage, invest in it. Value it. Be curious about your spouse. Be curious with your spouse. Notice things together where you say, man, what does God have for us? Live with purpose in your marriage. You say, Pastor, what does marriage have to do with the large-scale injustices that we see around us? If you're not living with purpose with your spouse, there's no way that you're going to have the energy or the passion or the creativity to notice something together and say, what is our call as a, as a couple following Jesus to bring justice into this situation? In your marriage, you live with purpose and not passivity. In school, where you know, man, I'm going to be graduating in five years or three years or two years or not soon enough, it is easy to kick back. I have done that many, many, many times. Can I encourage you to study with purpose? To study with purpose. Your education is going to be a, a huge way of you bringing about justice on the earth. Study with purpose. One last one I'm just going to throw out there. In your retirement, where you say, all right, I'm just kicking back. It's time now just to enjoy the years of my labor. Yes, it is. Enjoy your hobbies. Enjoy your friends. But don't think that your purpose has ended. 
As young folks, we need to look ahead and see people who have been doing the good work for a long time, not just disengaging, but staying engaged, living with purpose and not passivity. Jeremiah is announcing, don't become passive and just sit back and wait. Live into that God-given destiny, a purposeful settling down. Because something happens when you start settling down. When you start having a home, kids, you start to view the world around you, the injustice around you, and you have to start making decisions of how you're going to engage with that as you settle down. You have to start making decisions of, as a family now, are we going to just protect and retreat? Or are we going to lock into our purpose and to say, God, we know that you've called us as your people to be a people of justice, a citizen of justice, and a city of injustice. Help us to do that. We're not just going to retreat from what we dislike, but we are going to step into God's, given, to God's purpose for us. And then the word of the Lord gives us more clarity on what this looks like. In verse 7, it says this, Pursue the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pursue the peace and prosperity of the city. Those two words come from the same word of shalom. Shalom. And this is this beautiful reality of peace that Cornelius Plant. Plantiga uh, describes this way, the webbing together of God, humans, and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight. The webbing together of God, humans, and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight. Jeremiah is saying, how do you live as citizens of justice in a city of injustice? Pursue, seek after, desire the, the shalom, the peace, the prosperity of the city that you're at. They're in Babylon. This is the city of their enemies. I don't want my city and my enemies to, to experience peace and prosperity. Burn it to the ground. No, 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 you're the people of God. You pursue that. Pursue is not just like a sit back word. I don't know when the last time was that you pursued something, where you like looked for something, sought after it, took actions to get something. Maybe it was a purchase that you're like, man, I heard that this thing that I wanted is on sale. Oh, man, it's, it's, they don't have it at that store. And you start pursuing. You're like, i got to find it somewhere else. Uh, oh, they're out there. Okay, can I get it online? You start pursuing. i got to get this thing. Or maybe it's schooling. You're like, I've got I've to get into that class. I've got to get into that school. I don't know what the last thing that you pursued, but pursuing takes intention. Pursuing means you've like locked eyes on something. And you're going after it, saying, I have to get that thing that I've seen, that thing that I've desired, that thing that I want. I am going after it. Jeremiah is saying, pursue the peace, the well-being, the shalom of the city. You don't pursue the peace of something by just noticing what's already peaceful. Oh, man, I love that it's super safe in that neighborhood. That's great. I'm going to pursue peace there. That's not, that's already there. That's already there. You can just go and you can settle. But pursuing locks eyes on that which is not shalom. Pursuing locks eyes and you say, that's, that's not the way it is meant to be. You say, you know what, it bothers me that there's a 23% poverty rate in Humboldt Park. You lock eyes on something. You say, I, I'm going to, to pursue that. I'm going to take action steps to make that not the reality anymore. Or it says, it bothers me that there's so much homelessness in the city. What can I do? I'm going to pursue a solution. I'm going to pursue a healing effect or a healing response to the effects of evil. I praise God for the justice work happening out of this place, whether it's basketball or volleyball providing safe spaces or the women going out on the streets and serving the women on the streets or the food giveaway. I praise God that we are, as a church, that there are areas that we've locked eyes on and said we're going to pursue the well-being of this block, of this city, of this neighborhood. How do we live as citizens of justice in the city of injustice? By pursuing the peace of the city. Looking for and finding ways of blessing the city. And then lastly, praying for the peace of the city. 
praying for the peace of the city. Verse 7 ends this way, pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, that's the same word, shalom, the peace, the, the prosperity, if it prospers, you too will prosper. Pray for that. You don't just pursue it in your own effort and strength and passion. You engage your prayers. You engage with the Lord for the peace of the city. Pursuing and praying go hand in hand. Praying ensures that your vision and your dream of well-being for the city is actually that of the Lord's and not just your own. Because you'll hear justice thrown out around a lot. A lot. Everyone wants to make their issue a justice issue. And some are. Some are, but not quite in the full, like there's, there's a lot of complexity there. Everyone wants their, their issue to be a justice issue, including us oftentimes. We see someone who say, that's not right. And then we just rush ahead without saying, I got to pray. I got to ask God and bring it to his attention and be listening and saying, what is your response? What does it look like on earth as it is in heaven? God, I don't know. I need your answers. I've got to plead with you. I need to pray for the peace of the city. Prayer ensures that we don't become more enamored with our idea or our view of justice than with the God who has made us in his image. To know him, to hear from him, to implement what he has for us. Because justice detached from prayer just becomes burnout or you think that your salvation is found in the work that you're doing and not in the security found in the grace and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Imagine what this would look like. It's the people of God all over the city of Chicago, but more locally here in New Life Humble Park. Imagine what this would look like if we lived this way. And I praise God that we are. So it doesn't take a lot to imagine, but I know that there's even more, that there's more that God has for us, ways that we can be citizens of justice in the city of injustice. Ways that our block of Babylon could look more like Jerusalem the way it was intended. And several centuries later, we get a glimpse of what this sort of life looks like. The Emperor Julian of Rome, again, kingdoms had risen and fallen and risen and fallen, and now it's Rome. And it's the early church, it's 300 or so AD. So post Jesus, now we're really like in, in this space here. And the emperor is not a Christian at all. And he's trying to revive the pagan priests. He's bothered that they don't have a whole lot of influence. And he tells them who to look for and imitate in gaining influence with the people. He, he tells them this, build in each city frequent hostels in order that strangers may profit by our philanthropy. I do not mean for our own people only, but for others also who are in need of money. For it is disgraceful when no Jew ever has to beg. And the impious Galileans, that is, the Christians, the impious Galileans support not only their own poor, but ours as well. All men see our people lack aid from us. This is the emperor of Rome saying, look at the Christians in your community. You should be imitating them. Because people are noticing that they're not just taking care of their own, they're taking care of the poor around them as well. Look at them. He's looking at them saying, that's what it looks like to be a citizen of justice. I love that imagery of what was taking place there because those Christians, they didn't have any voting rights to say, you know what, like we want this emperor out of there. They didn't have any political power. They didn't have weight in their community in that way. The social media in their area wasn't getting blown up by how upset they were about something. They didn't, they didn't exert their energy in that way. They, they just saw issues of injustice. They saw image bearers of God being treated in ways that shouldn't be happening. They saw people not having the resources to live. And they didn't just say, well, that's Rome's problem. Babylon's being Babylon. Praise God, we're the people of God. 
They said, no, we need to do something. We follow a risen Savior who called us to pray on earth as it is in heaven. And this situation is not how it is in heaven. So we're going to step in and engage as the, as the church. Praise God, that's our legacy. Those are our forefathers and foremothers who have gone before us, who we will see one day in the new city. We'll hear stories where I say, yeah, I saw that baby and I took him in. And then that person wound up uh, discipling this person. We'll see stories interwoven, stories that we will share our own of, of injustices that we saw, people that we noticed, image bearers as we sung about this morning, who will experience the love of God, the justice of God through our actions. So this is what I want us to do this week. If you look at your handout, on the bottom right, there's a little area that I want you to write in where you're going to prayer walk this week. I say block, you could do a bunch of blocks. You could just do one. This is what I want us to do. I want you this week, minimum once, do it more often if you want, but to walk on the block, maybe it's your house, maybe it's a different block, but to walk and to pray, to say, God, what does it look like on earth as it is in heaven to be on this flock? Like, what does that look like? Lord, help me to notice the things that are not of you. Give me ideas of what it looks like to, to be a citizen of justice on this block. I heard a pastor, uh, Pastor Cy Fields, yesterday. He talked about, we're not going to change the city all at once. We're going to change it one block at a time. And I look around, I go, man, there's probably 30 different blocks represented here this morning. So what I want you to do is write down your name and the block. You don't have to put your house number if, if you don't want to. That's totally fine. I don't need to know where you live. Just put down the block, rip it out on the way out. There's a basket in the back, and just drop it in there. This is a way of corporate sort of accountability. If you're new, don't feel like you have to do this, right? I encourage you. We'd love to have you do it. This is a way that collectively we can say, then this week, this many blocks are getting prayed for, are having curious Christians saying, what does it look like for the kingdom of heaven to, to grow on this block? And then next week, I'm going to pull a couple of those sheets out and ask you how it went. You might say, that sounds horrible, and now I'm not going to do that. Um, Look, this is just a way of making sure that as a community, we're keeping each other accountable. If we want to be citizens of justice in a city of injustice, this is one way that that can start. Write it down, put your name on the way out, rip it out, put it in the basket right on the, the little table in the back. I'm going to call up the worship team. But as I've been working on this message and thinking about justice and injustice, it's been a sort of strange and often unpleasant experience. Not just like thinking about injustices in the world around us, but also, like I said, cities are a macrocosm of humanity. That you're aware of, I notice injustice around, but then I'm also aware that I am a part of that. And there's this tension in scripture. You'll hear the psalmist say, God, Deal with my enemies, but have mercy on me. And I've been perturbed or bothered or unsettled by the fact that the beauty of the gospel is not just that everyone gets what they deserve. There's a, there's a sort of radical injustice about the gospel. There's a radical uh, grace that God has taken upon himself, God who's perfect in Jesus Christ, died on our behalf, offering forgiveness to all who turn to him, to trust in him, that they don't get what they deserve. That the lamb who is the center of the city of the new city, is a lamb who offers us forgiveness. 
And I'll be honest, it's like a, it, it messes with your systems of who should get what and what justice looks like here and there. It's complicated. It's, it's complex. But I praise God that we serve a God who has stepped into injustice, not just saying the answer is just more violence and everyone just getting punishment doled out, but he has taken that on upon himself to offer you and I the freedom of forgiveness. The freedom to say, yes, I'm a sinner. Injustice doesn't just lie out there, that it lies within me as well. And I serve a God who has come for me, whose love is so great that he has saved me by laying down his own life. Would you stand with me? If you're here this morning and you have not experienced the forgiveness of God in your life, if you have not turned to him and said, Jesus, I need you, I need the forgiveness of my sins. I don't want you to leave this morning saying, well, that might be for next week. I want you to respond this morning. I'll be in the back. I would love to pray with you. But I'm going to pray over us, and then, then the worship team will lead us in worship. Jesus, thank you that you are a God of justice. And you're a God of love. And you have confronted evil on our behalf, God. We don't deserve your action on our behalf, but you have done it because you are a gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. We thank you that there's the judgment seat that awaits God, that you will vindicate us, that we don't have to look for vengeance upon uh, the people who have harmed us, that you are the God who is a judge, but you're also a God who provides forgiveness, that whose, whose desire is that all would come to you and experience forgiveness. Lord, we are grateful to be your people. And I ask that as we go forth from here, we would go by the power of your spirit, noticing injustice, noticing that which is not as it should be, and engaging with it as your people, God, as citizens of justice, God, in the city of injustice. In Jesus' name.